I'm very grateful to Gary both for his original invitation to um, speak in February and for his persistence um, in rearranging the lecture for this evening. I have to say, however, that seeing the number of you who have turned up this evening, I'm left wishing that we'd gone ahead in February. <laughs> The weather conditions are very different, aren't they? I would certainly not have been tempted to take my jacket. This both is and is not the lecture that I was planning to deliver then. Um, a little over three months have passed since the originally scheduled date, and the passage of time means that I'm speaking into a somewhat different context. So I have lightly revised the text uh, to take account of those things, but I've not rewritten the lecture as a, um, as a whole. It remains substantially uh, what I planned to say back then. But let me illustrate what I mean by saying that there is a different context today. By this time a year ago, my own appointment had been announced. A year ago, last February, it hadn't. Um, indeed, the confirmation of election at York Minster, which is an extraordinarily archaic legal ceremony um, at which I was invested with the jurisdiction of the Diocese of Sheffield and so technically became Bishop of Sheffield, took place on Monday the 5th of June uh, last year, so almost exactly 12 months ago. Uh, my final service at Liverpool Cathedral was on the 11th of June last year. We moved into Bishopscroft on the 14th of June last year, ready for the consecration, which was on the 22nd of June last year. So not least, but perhaps not only for me, memories of what was happening exactly 12 months ago tonight are positive ones. Memories of the vacancy in the Sea of Sheffield coming to an end. Had I delivered this lecture on the 28th of February, the context in terms of what was going on exactly 12 months previously would have been very different. In February 2017, the controversy over Bishop Phillips' nomination was at its height. The hashtag reaffirm5 was briefly trending on Twitter. Professor Martin Percy's influential piece had just been published in The Guardian, calling on Bishop Philip to withdraw voluntarily from the process of his appointment, and Bishop Philip was shortly to go on the, the retreat at which he would reach the decision to do just that for the sake of the unity of the church. And in February of 2017, which was three months after I had emerged from the discernment process as the alternate name for this see, I was still attempting, in good faith, but without making much headway, to let Sheffield go and to commit myself afresh to the fruitful ministry to which the Lord had called me in Liverpool. In fact, at the end of February 2017, pretty much on the 28th of February 2017, I was having to dig especially deep to prepare well for a speaking engagement I had been invited to take on about 18 months before as I was due within days in early March to lead a retreat at Scargill House in North Yorkshire for a group of clergy from the Diocese of Sheffield. As some of you know, it was while I was there on the 7th of March last year that I took the call from Archbishop Sentamu alerting me to the fact that Bishop Philip was indeed about to withdraw and asking me if I was still feeling called to this diocese. <laughs> Surrounded as I was in the gracious providence of God by 40 clergy from Sheffield, it was perhaps the easiest vocational decision <laughs> I have ever had to make. It is, as a matter of fact, the only time in 30 years of ordained ministry and 30 years of married life that I have accepted a post without first speaking to Cathy. Although, to be fair, she had walked every painful step of the previous three months with me, so I wasn't really in much doubt about what she would say. I wanted to start there, just in case anyone here tonight is unaware what the phrase mutual flourishing refers to. The title for this lecture was given to me by Gary many months ago. 
mutual flourishing in a place of disagreement, what does this have to say to the world? And the phrase mutual flourishing really has only one frame of reference, and that is to the Church of England in its attempt since 2014 to achieve a healthy, sustainable settlement for Christians with conflicting views about the appropriateness or otherwise of ordaining women as priests and bishops. It's not an absolute truth. There is a book called Towards Our Mutual Flourishing, which was published by ECUSA, the Episcopal Church of the USA, in 2012. But for one thing, I had never heard of that book until I started preparing this lecture, and I shall be seriously surprised if anybody else here tonight has heard of it either. And for another, it's clear that even then, the frame of reference isn't actually so very different from the one with which we are all too familiar. So I thought I ought to state from the beginning that I have assumed that I am being asked tonight to reflect on the concept of mutual flourishing as set out in the five guiding principles adopted by General Synod to enable the legislation which has allowed the consecration of women as bishops. And where the title of this lecture refers to a place of disagreement, I am assuming the primary reference is to our own diocese. I realize it could just mean mutual flourishing in an area of theological disagreement as a place in, in the sense of a topic. And even geographically, of course, I realize that ours is by no means the only place of disagreement. The review report published last September by Sir Philip Moore made it perfectly clear that the issues here are for the whole national church to address. As a matter of fact, none of his recommendations is directed at this diocese in particular. And by the way, if you haven't yet read that report, I do urge you to do it. Uh, you can find it easily enough online. But the controversies of the vacancy in this sea remain very fresh for many of us, and I shall have that very much in my mind as I speak to you this evening. Indeed, I am more than usually aware of my responsibility not to speak carelessly or loosely tonight, because next week many of us will gather for our diocesan conference in Swanwick, at which I am hoping we may cross something of a watershed enabling us to draw a line under the distresses of the vacancy and so to renew our commitment to the challenges of mutual flourishing into the future. I'm hoping that next week's conference will enable us to move on from any tendency to look back to a new commitment to look forward with a sufficient sense of healing and reconciliation to enable us to bear a united witness to Jesus to the world. So I'm all the more grateful for the outward, even missionary twist at the end of the title of this lecture. Mutual flourishing in a place of disagreement, what does this have to say to the world? You see, I care very much about mutual flourishing, and I care very much indeed about the Diocese of Sheffield, this particular place of disagreement. But I care most of all about the world, and about the message the church sends to the world, about the extent to which our behavior as a church does not reinforce the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. After all, it really is only in order to share that message in word and deed that there is a church at all. So one other preliminary remark. Uh, coincidentally, and it was sheer coincidence, um, in the very week in which this lecture was originally scheduled, I met with Bishop Philip North for lunch. We had been promising ourselves that we would find an opportunity to chat privately together about what has happened and about how we might now assist one another in the ministries to which the Lord has called each of us. He was, as those of you who know Bishop Philip would expect, witty, thoughtful, generous, and not just to me, but to all who have been involved in this process, provocative and magnanimous. And I do want this evening to reiterate my gratitude to him for his unfailing personal support for me since my own appointment was announced. So, on with the substance of what I want to say this evening. And actually, what I really want to do is talk to you about generosity. Uh, those of you who I might need your help, Dan. No. no? Uh, 
Great, thank you. Uh, those of you who were there at the service of installation at the cathedral, which inaugurated my public ministry last September, may remember not only that this was the theme of my sermon that day, but also that I warned you that it is a theme that I shall want to return to. Often, I spoke about my longing that our diocese should be known as a diocese which is generous with Jesus, in the sense both of a diocese which gives Jesus himself away freely and also of a diocese that models its life on the generosity of Jesus himself. So while I am intending to structure this talk around the three elements of the title, mutual flourishing, a place of disagreement, and a message to the world, what I hope you will hear fundamentally is a plea for generosity as the only proper response of Christian people to all that God has done for us in Christ. Gratitude is always the right response to the grace God has demonstrated in the gospel, and generosity is just the outworking of that gratitude. But in terms of a structure then, shall I just wave at you, Dan, and get you to do it? Thank you. Great. In terms of a structure, um, I want to say something firstly about mutual flourishing and the five guiding principles. Um, that part of the lecture is inevitably going to be a bit dry and detailed, I'm afraid. I just have to engage with some texts. But I'll go on to say something secondly about my hopes for this diocese as a place of disagreement and about the opportunity that we have to model something for the wider church and then something finally about the missionary opportunity here as I see it as the wider church models something for the wider world. And I hope that more or less meets with your expectations. Thank you, Dan. One more. First of all, then, mutual flourishing. In 2014, uh, the Church of England adopted the so-called five guiding principles as part of the settlement agreed by the General Synod to enable the ordination of women as bishops. It was those principles to which the hashtag reaffirm five was referring when the controversy was at its height on social media last year. And it's fair to say that the five guiding principles have come in for some criticism over the course of the past 12 months. For that reason, the Faith and Order Commission of the Church of England has just published this year a study guide, thank you, Dan, to the five guiding principles, which it describes as uh, a commentary on the House of Bishops Declaration on the Ministry of Bishops and Priests. It's available online, and I would encourage you to find it and read it after this evening if you would like to. It's part of the response of the National Church to Sir Philip Moore's report. It has a good deal to say about mutual flourishing, and I will draw on it somewhat in what I say here. But I want to remind you, first of all, of the five guiding principles themselves, because the term mutual flourishing occurs in them. Indeed, since it occurs at the end of the fifth and last one, you could argue that the term mutual flourishing has a climactic place in the five guiding principles. You could argue that the five guiding principles are ultimately about mutual flourishing. I can't see any alternative to wading through these, all five in turn, but I'll try to be as snappy as I can. And here they are. Thank you. Come, bishops, the Church of England is fully and unequivocally committed to all orders of ministry being open equally to all without reference to gender and holds that those whom it has duly ordained and appointed to office are the true and lawful holders of the office which they occupy and thus deserve our due respect and canonical obedience. In short, that means that women ordained as bishops are true bishops with full jurisdiction, however recent this development has been for our church, and that all orders of ministry which, please note, for better or worse, is not the same as all posts, all orders of ministry ought to be open to all clergy, male or female. Two, anyone who ministers within the Church of England must be prepared to acknowledge that the Church of England has re reached a clear decision on the matter. That means that even if in conscience you believe the Church of England has made a terrible mistake here, you must still, if you are going to be a member of the Church of England yourself, acknowledge that the Church of England has made its decision validly and for good and all. Three, 
Since it continues to share the historic episcopate with other churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and those provinces of the Anglican Communion, which continue to ordain only men as priests and bishops, the Church of England acknowledges that its own clear decision on ministry and gender is set within a broader process of discernment within the Anglican Communion and the whole Church of God. In other words, it has to be acknowledged that the Church of England has made this move out of step with key ecumenical partners so that those who are opposed to this move within the Church of England do have some ecumenical weight on their side as well as some good company within the Anglican Communion. Four, since those within the Church of England who on grounds of theological conviction are unable to receive the ministry of women bishops or priests continue to be within the spectrum of teaching and tradition of the Anglican Communion, the Church of England remains committed to enabling them to flourish within its life and structures. That's to say, for that ecumenical reason, and on account of the situation in other parts of the Anglican Communion, those who are unable to receive the ministry of women bishops and priests in the C of E must be permitted to stay and to find an honoured place among us. And five, Pastoral and sacramental provision for the minority within the Church of England will be made without specifying a limit of time and in a way that maintains the highest possible degree of communion and contributes to mutual flourishing across the Church of England. In other words, for that reason, with no time limit envisaged, Pastoral and sacramental provision will be made for those who cannot accept the ordination of women as bishops and priests in a way, and here is the crucial phrase, that maintains the highest possible degree of communion and contributes to the mutual flourishing across the whole Church of England. I want to try to spell out three things that that does not mean and one that I think it does. The first thing I think it does not mean is that we have arrived at a full and final resolution of this matter. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I am not saying that the current position is temporary, certainly not in the sense that it will exist for a fixed term only. Principle five is absolutely clear about that. Space in terms of pastoral and sacramental provision for the minority has been made in the Church of England without specifying a time limit. I'm also not saying that I think the ordination of women as priests and bishops is reversible. That is ruled out by principle one. The Church of England has reached an unequivocal decision on this matter. But no Christian can ever be content with an impaired communion with our brothers and sisters. Just as we work and pray for the day when we will be fully one with our Methodist or Roman Catholic friends, so it is incumbent on all of us to pray for the day when we'll enjoy not only what the fifth principle calls the highest possible degree of communion, but full communion with one another. None of us should be prepared to settle for this arrangement. All of us should be vexed by it, frustrated by it, as if it was an itchy vest or something. Mutual flourishing is not the best case ever possible for the future. Secondly, in the meanwhile, it does not mean that we are doomed to live as two integrities leading entirely separate and parallel lives. That uh, recent publication by the Faith and Order Commission to which I've already referred states that mutual flourishing should not be taken to legitimate deepening separation as though we will flourish more if we have less to do with one another. You see, Eucharistic communion is not the only form that communion takes within the Church of England. We also establish koinonia, to use the Greek word partnership, fellowship in the gospel through missionary activity, through doing things together, and through our synodical structures. And that is why it matters that we are all seeking what the fifth principle calls the highest possible degree of communion, when we can be together, when we can do things together, we should. And that's a responsibility we all share. But thirdly, the five guiding principles do not mean that we have arrived at a pain-free arrangement. On the contrary, 
the document recognizes that a commitment to mutual flourishing does not come without serious costs, and it needs to be acknowledged that in different situations they may be unevenly distributed and may fall more heavily on some for reasons not of their own choosing. It's good that the statement says these things need to be acknowledged, because they do. And I fear that since the publication of the five guiding principles four years ago, we have rather suppressed that acknowledgement so that people have been bearing their pain in silence, as though it would be wrong for them to admit it or express it, and that's neither right nor healthy. And I hope it goes without saying that the pain is not all on one side. Obviously, there is pain for ordained women whose ministries are not universally acknowledged. And there's pain for those who support their ordination among lay women and lay and ordained men. And there's pain for those who cannot accept the ordination of women, men and women, lay and ordained, for whom the church has moved away in a direction they did not choose. And if I may speak personally again for a moment, there is also pain for a male bishop who chooses to ordain women, but who finds as a result that his episcopal oversight is effectively restricted in that there are some parishes in which he will never be invited to confirm, for example. There is pain, and it is pretty much everywhere, and that is a reality for pretty much all of us. Three things it doesn't mean. One, that it does. What is the one thing I think mutual flourishing does mean? Well, I think it means that we have a challenging opportunity here, thanks Dan, the next slide, to be generous to one another. You see, both proponents and opponents of the ordination of women can claim to be the vulnerable minority here. Women, because we live in a society in which the genders are still by no means equal, in which equal pay for equal work is still not a reality, in which sexual harassment of women remains a widespread problem, as the hashtag MeToo campaign has recently reminded us, in which many women suffer domestic violence, in a world in which the vast majority of those who are subjected to trafficking, to slavery, are female. For many women, the pain they feel in being asked to embrace mutual flourishing reflects their experience that the ordination of women is inseparable from these wider issues in which women remain acutely vulnerable. But opponents of the ordination of women also feel vulnerable. They were in the minority when the legislation was passed in Synod, and they remain in the minority in every diocese in the Church of England, including, so I'm told, in London, Truro, and Chichester. They feel the tide going out, the current flowing fast against them. So all have grounds to shrink back from the call to generosity, but I do believe that is what each and every baptized Christian is called to, a life of sacrificial generosity in gratitude for the grace of God revealed in Jesus is the Christian way. Generosity, I believe, is an absolute gospel imperative for all Christians at all times and in all places, and I believe this to be a tough but urgent area in which members of the Church of England are called to put generosity into practice. There is a challenging opportunity here for each of us to believe the best in one another, to seek the best for one another. To quote that uh, Faith and Order Commission document once more, mutual flourishing is not a zero-sum game in which the flourishing of some can be imagined as coming only at the cost of the diminishment of others. Mutual flourishing then, and this is to repeat the one thing I think it does mean, is the outworking in one very particular arena of a much more general responsibility which every Christian has to seek the welfare of every other one. It is one particularly difficult arena in which to apply the teaching of the St. Paul that each of us should look not only to our own interests but also to the interests of others, considering others better than ourselves. Mutual flourishing then for the Church of England as a whole is a challenge to our generosity. 
So let me go on secondly to the middle part of the lecture I have been given, to the title I've been given, by focusing on the life of our own diocese. And when I've spoken for perhaps 10 minutes more, we'll break for um, some initial responses. Everything so far that I've said I think is true for the whole Church of England, how does it play out here in Sheffield? In particular, what chance is there of a phoenix rising from the ashes of a year ago? Christians are always people of hope for two related theological reasons. The first is that at the heart of our faith is that moment when, by raising Christ Jesus from the dead, God turned apparent defeat into glorious victory, darkness into light, and yes, despair into new hope. The second is that the resurrection of our Lord Jesus is simply the first fruit of God's new creation, and we believe that what God has begun in Christ, He will bring to completion at the coming of His kingdom. We are people of hope because when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we do so in the light of God's promise to bring that work to fulfillment. So in that light, in that hope, what can we hope for in this diocese in relation to this issue? Is there any chance at all that we might yet look back to find that the Lord has wrought something good out of an essentially bad episode in our life, something glorious out of the mess. Might we yet discover that our diocese has something positive, even transformative, to offer to the wider church? We must hope so. For two reasons, we must hope so. The first reason is this. I only discovered quite recently that the Diocese of Sheffield has a higher proportion of parishes seeking extended Episcopal oversight than any other diocese in the Church of England outside London. Extended Episcopal oversight is the phrase used to describe the provision which has been made to both traditional Catholic and conservative evangelical parishes to enable them to receive the ministry of a bishop who reflects their theological views in relation to the ordination of women. In this diocese, that ministry is provided to traditional Catholic parishes by Glynn, the Bishop of Beverley, and by conserv to conservative evangelical ones by Rod, the Bishop of Maidstone. And this is a good opportunity for me to express publicly my appreciation to the two of them for the spirit in which they are exercising their particularly tricky ministries. Certainly I know that there was nothing like the proportion of parishes seeking extended Episcopal oversight in the Diocese of Liverpool, from which I came here, or in the Diocese of Lichfield, where I was before that. But equally, Sheffield now lies 12th in the league table of dioceses produced by Watch, that's women in the church, recording the proportion of female incumbents. We currently have about 29%. That's not enough. Ely sits top of the table with 40%. But interestingly, the Diocese of London lies 39th out of 41 with just 13%. So here, once again, is a particular challenge and opportunity. How do we ensure mutual flourishing with two such high and apparently competing proportions. Mutual flourishing might be harder to achieve here than anywhere else, but oh my goodness, what a gift we would have to offer the church if we could model it. The second reason why I believe we have to try relates to the situation which existed in this diocese two years ago as Bishop Stephen left. You see, one of the conclusions of the Moore Report is that not enough was done after 2014 to embed the five guiding principles in parishes and deaneries across the Church of England. Well, that may be so. And arguably, the furore over Bishop Philip's appointment reflects the fact that not enough was done in this diocese. But my friends, that is not the whole story. The great irony is that more had been done in the Diocese of Sheffield than anywhere else I know, again with the possible exception of the Diocese of London. I think, for example, of the excellent work that Bishop David Horton did in collaboration with his working group in producing the report New Norms, New Beginning. Few dioceses across the Church of England commissioned anything like that, nothing nearly so substantial or ambitious. I don't see that we have any alternative but to embrace as a vocation as our calling under God to make this 
a place, this place of disagreement, this diocese, a place of good disagreement. I don't say a place of, ag of agreement, but to disagree generously and so to ensure our mutual flourishing. The three listening sessions which we held between Epiphany and Palm Sunday were a first step in that direction, but only a first step. In time for the diocesan conference, we are about to circulate the collected sentences left by those who participated in those sessions, and Canon Sarah Hills will be coming to the conference next week to help us as we reflect together on what the next steps might be. My own view is that they will involve at least two things, one structural, one relational. The structural step will be to dust off Bishop Horton's report, New Norms, New Beginning, and ask every PCC in the diocese to re engage with it in the coming year. The relational step will be to have a team of homegrown facilitators to assist any among us who might like to take part in more extended, more intimate versions of those listening sessions, an Indaba-style process of conversation. The listening sessions were well worth doing, but the groups were large and each met only once, so there was a real limit on what outcomes were possible. A longer process for smaller groups will offer a greater opportunity for the recovery of trust and understanding for those who would welcome that sort of process. Though many, and I know this because they've already told me, will prefer to build that trust and understanding across divides simply by engaging in mission together. But just for the record, and with this I'll finish this second section, I want to spell out three commitments of my own as I seek to foster a generous and flourishing Diocese of Sheffield in the coming years. First, I am committed to ensuring that all senior posts in this diocese are open equally to all without reference to gender and indeed without reference to theological standpoint on this issue. As vacancies arise, I hope to diversify the senior staff team, and in principle, I am serious that a traditional Catholic or a conservative evangelical, as well, of course, as a woman, would be a welcome applicant for an archdeacon's post or a suffragan bishop's post, although I hasten to add I am not expecting to need to fill any of those posts any time soon. The only exception, for reasons which I hope are obvious, is the recent vacancy for a Dean of Women's Ministry, which was reserved for a woman. It's a post that I have recently filled, and I've been able to announce today in what has actually been coincidence but has felt providential, uh, that we've appointed the Reverend Amanda Barraclough, a Rector of Sprotborough, Area Dean of Adwick Le Street, to be the Dean of Women's Ministry for this diocese. And although I am delighted with the appointment we have made, I would also like to say that I am looking forward to the day when we don't need a Dean of Women's Ministry on the senior staff team because women are fully represented there as in every sphere of ministry, lay and ordained across the diocese, so that a dedicated Dean is no longer needed to promote the interests and welfare of the women in ministry among us. My second commitment is not to rule out increasing the number of parishes which seek extended Episcopal oversight. Where a PCC wishes to pass the relevant resolutions, where an opportunity arises to appoint a strong candidate who happens to be a traditional Catholic priest or a conservative evangelical presbyter, I will be prepared to do that, even though it will cost me a substantial pang to create one more parish in which I, in all likelihood, will not be invited to confirm or to preside at Holy Communion. But thirdly, I am committed to increasing the proportion of stipendary female incumbents. I see no reason why, if we can recruit well, we should not see the proportion of female incumbents rise from 29%. 41% is not out of reach, and we might well displace Ely at the top of that watch league table. There is a journey ahead of us in the coming years. I'm not naive, and I know it will not be a journey without pain, but I hope that you can see that it is also not a journey without hope. Thank you. Let me
come um, to my final point, to the uh, question at the end of uh, the, the title of this evening's lecture, a mutual flourishing in a place of disagreement, what does this have to say to the world? Uh, one of the demoralizing aspects of the controversy last year was the fact that the wider world really struggled to make any sense of our disagreement. We failed to present ourselves in a way which would cause outsiders to admire us more. Yet at the time, I found it encouraging that our controversy did matter to local people outside our congregations. At a time when we may be tempted to suppose that the church is increasingly irrelevant to most people, increasingly marginal and marginalised, it was interesting to note that many outside the church, many in local and national politics, many in the media wanted to have their say. Friends, the church still matters to wider society and that too is a challenge to us and an opportunity for us. You see, one of the weaknesses of our society at present is the standard of public discourse. We live in a culture which has lost the capacity to disagree well, lost the capacity to handle disagreement in a way which is kind and generous. And this might yet be a gift the Church of England can help our nation to recover, though we do have some work to do recovering it for ourselves first. Our politics is adversarial. Just listen to the braying, booing pantomime, which is Prime Minister's question time each week. Just reflect again on the tone of campaigning ahead of the EU referendum two years ago. Our media is adversary. Watch any current affairs programme, any televised debate. There is no room for nuance anymore, no room for subtlety. All we do now is shout at one another, swapping slogans, grabbing headlines, ramping up the volume of the latest slanging match. There is precious little generosity in the public square. But it doesn't have to be this way. It could be, it really could be, that the Church, the Church of England, can assist our nation in recovering some maturity in the way we relate to those with whom we disagree. Archbishop Justin's new book, thank you, Dan, Reimagining Britain Foundations for Hope, has something to say about this and it's well worth a read if you've not already seen it. So this evening I want to add my voice to those who are calling for a different kind of public discourse, a more generous and respectful kind. So I'd like to offer you to finish with my own version of five rules for speaking to or about those with whom we disagree. I owe some of the phrasing in what follows to an old friend and colleague of mine called David Runcorn, who has done some really excellent work in this area. And I offer them convinced that this really matters for the future health and well-being of our nation. I often convinced that the church has a real contribution to make to the public square in this area, though mindful, as I've just said, that we've got some work to do to put our own house in order first. So, here are five rules to restore respect and generosity to public discourse. My first rule isn't actually to do with the way we speak to and about those with whom we disagree, because I believe that respect and generosity begins even farther back. It begins with the way we listen to one another. So my first rule is this. I will listen carefully to others, and especially to those with whom I disagree, truly accepting the possibility that listening to others will change, or at least modify, my own beliefs. In other words, I'm inviting a commitment to mutual flourishing, which involves, if not an acceptance that I could be wrong at the very point at issue, at least means an acceptance that I may have something to learn as I listen. Secondly then, in the way I speak to or about those with whom I disagree, I will affirm common ground and pay compliments where I sincerely can. I will build bridges actively looking for the things to which I can say yes for the things that I can applaud, for the things that I can commend, and when I see them, I will say so. 
Thirdly, I will not impute disreputable personal motives or characteristics as a way of discrediting those with whom I disagree. Instead, I will assume the best of intentions in my opponents and not the worst. If they are Christians, I will assume that they are seeking in sincerity to serve their Lord and Master, who is my Lord and Master. And if they are not, I will still assume that they are seeking to act and to speak with integrity, even if I believe them to be wrong. Fourthly, I will argue with the best of my opponents' beliefs and practices, and not with the worst. I will not give in to the temptation to take cheap shots at my opponents. I will not shoot at their strong men, nor mock caricatures of my opponent's position. And fifthly and finally, I will not publicly criticise individuals or groups I disagree with unless I am willing to express my views personally to them if love and wisdom require it. In other words, I won't say one thing about them and another thing to them. As far as possible, I will front up courageously as well as generously. And on that note, I'm going to stop. Mutual flourishing in a place of disagreement what does this have to say to the world? Well, if, and I accept it's a big if, what it has to say to the world is, dear friends, you don't have to settle for shouting down your opponents. There is another way, a more generous way. It is possible for people to disagree well, and a healthy society will encourage that. Of course, there is still a greater goal. If, and it's a big if, by the grace of God, we can recover in the church a real mutual flourishing, a real capacity to speak kindly of those and to those with whom we disagree. We will, I dare say, be that much closer to loving one another as our Saviour called us to do. I hardly need you to re I hardly need to remind you what he told his first followers. Because there is a real missionary benefit to the world if the church can model generosity in relationships across difference. Thank you, Dan. By this shall all people know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much.